Let's read. Now Ahab, verse 1, told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So, verse 2, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba, Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom, tr- broom brush, sat down under it, prayed that he may die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I know I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank it and then what? Lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. For the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached orbit, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him saying to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Look at your neighbor and say, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on a mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. After there was a wind, an earthquake, But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came, a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled back his cloak, covered his face, and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He then, he replied, I've been very zealous. Sorry, he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then Lord said, go back the way you came. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to preach. Remove everything that may be like me out, and just fill your Holy Spirit up that's been brewing in me already. Let the people see whatever it is you want them to learn today, God, and let them be able to take it out of these four walls to their neighbors, to their friends, to their families. Watch this. And then first to them, let us sit and wrestle with your word. When we see stories like this and hear stories like this and hear this message, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Let every heart say amen. Hey, the title of my message today is, What Are You Doing Here? Look at your neighbor and say, What Are You Doing Here? Okay, uh, you saw that be a theme in that gospel. God asks Elijah twice, what are you doing here? Uh, I am in a very uh, interesting place um, in uh, a stage in um, parenting. My daughter is two. Uh, If you've seen her, she's running, probably running with Pastor Destin's kids or all the other baby kids that run around the church. We apologize. We let them be free. Um, and, and, And she's in this stage now where she's talking. She's developing a personality. She's saying stuff that we did not teach her appropriately. Um, but it'll be something like um, the other day, uh, my, my wife told me uh, she was looking for something or like, like we had something. I had put it up. She couldn't find it. And then I took it down and I gave it to her. And she said, uh, oh, my God, where did you find this? I've been looking for this all day of the equivalent. And I'm like, wait, what? You're two. You haven't been looking for anything all day. Trust me, I've been with you. Uh, and, but where is this coming from? Like this, this vocabulary, these structures of sinners to even think that I've been looking for this all day. You have it. Like, you don't even know, like what? Um, and then, um, I, I, I am a self-proclaimed handyman. Shout out to my grandfather who kind of teached me a lot of my handyman stuff. So I can fix stuff kind of. And, and, and so I'm in the, the process of rebuilding my house and, and making sure that it's, you know, some stuff that I can touch and fix, I'll fix. But some stuff, I'm like, 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to just call the professionals, right? And so she would see me fix things. And in, in, in uh, this one particular day, I'm fixing a, a, a toilet placer, you know, like the thing you put the toilet roll on, you put it on the wall. I'm having, I'm struggling with fixing this today, right? And I'm trying to level it, it keep, it's off a little bit. And she comes in the bathroom, she says, Daddy, what are we fixing today? And my heart just warmed up. I was like, you know what? This is what we fixed. You going to help Daddy? And she's like, yeah. And, and, and I begin uh, to get a, a, a lot of testosterone boost. Uh, my masculinity grew a little bit because now my daughter is watching me fix something. And I go to drill and level it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, you, you got to act like you know what you're doing. And then I look back, and she's gone. Uh, um, so um, my, my pride, my pride was definitely her. She did not care about the toilet hole placer uh, at all. And as I'm struggling, just kind of get it leveled, um, and I'm drilling like a lot of holes in the wall, so I'm like, dang, I got some patchwork to do here, too. I'm like, I'm making a mess for myself. I look for the screws that I need to kind of make it stronger, and they're gone. Um, I'm looking for the caps, and they are gone. And then it dawned on me, she says, um, stole my tools, okay? Um, so that's why she left so fast. So I called my wife and said, hey, I'm trying to keep, I finally got a level. Can you please bring me this stuff? So she, she, she hunts down Annalise. She's on her bike, and she's just riding the house on her little tricycle. And, and the, the stuff is in her back of her bike. So she took my tools and was driving around the house with them. I was like, okay, got it fixed. And it was still, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going to pass this. I'm a perfectionist. Like, if it's a little bit off, I feel like I got to redo the whole thing. So I'm looking at it. I'm like, Trey, you can, it's okay. Let it go. And I'm, my brain is perplexed at this point because I'm being really, really kind of like, OCD about it, right? And then she comes back in there, and she says, oh. And I said, hello, Annalie, do you like it? She said, huh, what are you doing here? Insecurity grew again. Like, I knew it was off. <laughs> she could tell. The problem was that, like Elijah, I was focused on doing the purpose and the things that I needed to complete the task at hand. However, my daughter saw fit to steal my tools to make it a little bit more difficult. Similar to Elijah, he's doing what called him to do. And let me just give you a little backstory. I, I, Elijah is coming off what I like to call a series of just hotness with Jesus and God. Like, and you don't believe me, the guy was literally on fire for Jesus, not him himself, but he was calling down fire. So let me give you a little rundown. He, 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 he goes to King Ahab and says, hey, man, it ain't running no more here. No more rain for the country. Wait, what? Elijah the prophet says no more rain, and it doesn't rain anymore. They have a severe famine that's hitting the land because Elijah said, nah, it ain't raining no more here. Then he goes into this woman. He helped bring a son. The son has died. Elijah prays to God. The son gets back resurrected. So he can cause a drought. Elijah, with God's help, can raise people. And then he's talking uh, between, uh, between these 450 prophets that worship false gods. It's him, them, versus Elijah. And it's like this contest is happening where they build these altars, and they say, whoever God is real will send fire down from heaven and burn up the sacrifice. Well, Elijah says, hey, it's 450 of y'all. Y'all go first because it's just me. So I got Y'all, y'all go first. And, and, and as they're doing whatever it is they're doing to make that God come down, nothing happens, obviously, false God. And Elijah begins to mock them and joke and say, maybe your God is in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and he has this swagger to him that when you read the text, you're like, well, I would have been the same way. Elijah, my, Elijah, I like Elijah. He's joining people in the Bible. I knew you could do this. I knew you could roast folks. And then he begins to pray before God, and then, of course, God shows up and sets the altar on fire. And Elijah's like, well, y'all know the arrangement was, and this is where it gets brutal. It's not a cute story, by the way. It's, it's, it's after that, he has to kill all 450 of them, because if they would have, you know, it would have happened for them, Elijah would have been dead. Now, this is interesting to me, because if you have fire rain down from heaven, I, I, I will get a, a way more cockier. If, if I call, was praying and, I, and somebody cut me off on 285 and I said, God, strike them and lightning tore that car up, my head would get, I'm going to tell you, it won't fit in this church how big my head would get. Y'all don't know what kind of God I serve. Lightning come down for me. <laughs> you, you think I'm playing? Boom. Like, 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 I, that's why it won't, it won't happen for me. God, like, too much power for you, buddy. You just, you get light miracles, okay? 
and, 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 and here, I, he's on this kind of wave. He has his energy with him. He's cocky. He's feeling it. And he gets a threat from Jezebel. A threat. She didn't put him in jail. She didn't beat him up. She ain't sending goons. She sent a servant. And she says, by this time tomorrow, you'll be dead, bro. And he gets so scared, he runs away. And in my head, the first thing I thought, why didn't you just ask God to blow her up? <laughs> and it shows you how in a matter of seconds, things can change, especially when you're on course or off course with your purpose. So he runs. And you got to know this, because most people say, it's Jezebel. Why was he so scared of Je Jezebel? Well, you, if you read the couple of chapters before, what you'll see is she was putting to death all the prophets. She had decreed it, and they was killing the prophets of God, like, a lot, like persecution. So, so much so that Obadiah, Obadiah said, excuse me, Obadiah said, I had to hide 100 prophets in a cave because she was going to kill them. And so Elijah knows she's, she, when she says something, she, she, she meant it. So he gets scared, and he runs away. And, it's, and, and, and I, I just want to show you three things I see in the text, but then I'm going to give you the points. And the first thing I see in the text that is really interesting is that Elijah receives a threat. Are you taking notes? Put that in your notes. Elijah receives a threat. Now, Pastor Dustin said he's giving $100 to the person who takes the best notes. So good luck. No, I'm just kidding. Y'all know he's not doing that. We know <laughs> uh, he's not. Either, either. He receives a threat. It was an empty threat. It didn't mean anything, especially after Elijah has seen and all the stuff he's done. And the problem I have with Elijah is you ran off an empty threat? You, 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 you didn't even ask God, are you going to let her touch me? You didn't ask God anything. He lost his confidence. He, he lost his fight off of a, a, a threat. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I didn't grow up in no, no Brady Bunch community, no Leave it to Beaver type community, right? I grew up in a community where every now and then you had to defend yourself because you just had to, you had to throw hands sometimes. You, 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 you can go through, if you grew up where I grew up and you went out without a fight, a fight, God was really on you. I had to fight a couple of times. And I will never forget how, how sometimes I, I was a lover. I'm not really a fighter, but I knew I had to, you know, be violent sometimes. And, and one of these times I will never forget, uh, uh, I heard this, adults would say it, but I just kind of picked it up. And some of my fighters, you would know what I'm about to say when I say this, is I had a person talking junk to me, and I said, hey, man, listen here, listen here. You cross this line, I promise you it's going down. Cross it. I, I was, woo, cross it. Because you got, you right. See, I want people who don't like to fight. You know, you got you to gotta flap. You know, you got to act like, <laughs> please don't cross the line, Jesus. <laughs> but you got to act like you can do, you got to act like it. So I said, cross this line, cross this line. And the person responded to me and said, is that a threat? And what did I say back? It's not a threat. It's a, see, that's all my fighters in the room. That's all my fighters. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I, 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 so y'all grew up in a, a non-leave-it-to-beaver community as well. Okay, awesome. I thought I was alone for a second. And what you're saying is, is I'm not having empty threats with you if you continue to progress in the way that you are. I'm going to make you a guarantee if you cross this line, Something will go ha happen. Now, whether I win or lose is now the point. The point now is you know better next time than to cross this line. And it bothered me because Eliza ran on an empty threat. She didn't even say, I'm, I'm killing you now. She could have sent her guard. She could have sent anybody to come kill her. She sent a servant. She wasn't being serious. She was just angry that she got proven that her false god wasn't real. And he ran away. And then watch this. You see another thing in the text. Eliza, you know, receives a threat. Elijah runs away tirelessly. He runs away for like 24 hours. Do you, have, do you, got, you know how scared you got to be to run for 24 hours? 24. I was, I was like, Elijah, at some point, for me, the first two hours, all right, God, what do you want us to do here? Because uh, I, I can't run no more. <laughs> and then... When he, when he runs away, he, he's emptied, he, he, he's off God's plan, he's off God's purpose, he's just out off of an empty threat. And, and you can see all this fear has mustered up inside of him. And then the last thing you see just kind of in the text is Elijah regrets, regrets his task. He starts talking wild. 
The same guy in a couple of verses, a couple of chapters back, was like, hey, is your God in the bathroom? Joking, mocking, calling fire down from the sky. The same guy that healed and resurrected the kid. The same guy that said no world is going to happen in here. No rain going to happen here until I say so. It's the same guy who sit up there and said, God, I can't do this no more. I'm tired of doing this. He, he gets so mad. If you go back and read, he curses the tree he's sleeping under. He gets so mad. I don't even like this tree. Whoa. I'm poor little tree. I had nothing to do with this. And he's like getting cursed by Elijah. Watch this. The angel of the Lord does what? Wakes him up with food. He doesn't even say thank you. He rolls back over and goes back to sleep. And it shows you that on your journey with God, there are some things that will happen that's unexpected that can get you to shift your purpose and the plan God has for you. I want you to see today that you're made well. You have a purpose. God has a plan for you. But you can mess it up. Dark times can come. And if you're not understanding that this is the part of the journey, you may stay somewhere where God is asking you the same question, what are you doing here? Hey, 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 hey. In your dark, dark moments, if you're taking notes, here we go. We're in the sermon now. We're in, we're in the meat of it. You may experience despair. Despair. Look at your neighbor and say Despair. This is, without a doubt, most theologians say that Elijah is depressed. And it happens fast. He gets a threat, and immediately he starts cursing things. He starts sleeping. He starts complaining about everything. And there will be moments in your journey where you will feel like, God, I I don't feel like being here today. That, watch this. Church folks, it is okay to feel like that. You don't, you don't, you don't, Trey, I don't, what are you saying? It's okay to be depressed? No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that all the way. But I'm saying you will experience it on the journey. Okay, I can, I can see in a room, y'all don't believe me. Let me give you a couple of people. David, when he lost his son, you know, the one he got, he made, uh, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. He prayed, he was fasting, and he asked God, hey, can you heal my son? And God's like, nah. And, and if you go read Psalms 51, you will see how, how, how broken he was. And he says this, David says stuff like this. He says this in Psalms, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. David said, when you are downcasted, oh, my soul, why so disturbed within me? My soul is disturbed within me, but I put my hope in God, and I will yet praise him because he's my savior, but my soul is messed up. I don't feel like myself. Uh, Jonah, if you read Jonah, Jonah has some, a lot of issues with God. He was always upset with God for healing folks and doing something that God was doing. Jonah said this, now, O oh Lord, Take away my life, for it's better for me to die than live. Jonah also said, even after God reached out to Jonah again with great capacity, he responded like this, I am angry enough to die. Jonah, okay, you don't like Jonah? Okay, cool. Job, Job lost everything. That's why I tell people, just read Job. If you ever feel like you're losing stuff, you're probably on your path. Just, you ain't Job, though. Relax. Chill. Take a break. Because you can, God can say, are you righteous? I choose you. No, 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 don't choose me. I'm good. It's not me. Job. He said, well, look at what Job said. Why did I perish? Why did not die at my birth? Why did I not perish at my birth? And die as I came from the Why was I even born? Why did he Job said this. I have no peace. No quietness. I have no rest. Joe must have had a two-year-old. <laughs> but only turmoil. There are some, some people in the Bible that you can see. They went through some things. Okay, y'all like, those are the people in the Bible, but you use it. Okay, okay, okay. Even Jesus filled with despair. Make sure y'all didn't throw nothing at me. Mark 14, 36, 40, 36 says this. Jesus said, and he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. He's talking to his disciples. 
And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it was possible that the hour may pass. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible before you. Watch this. He's saying to God, 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 my Father, my Father, all things are possible. You can do all things. I seen you. I was with you when you created heavens and earth. I know that you can change this. I don't have to die on this cross, God. I know we don't have to do this. God, if I don't have to experience this, can you change it, God? And God, and he says, oh, all things are possible for you. Can you remove this cup from me? And, he, and God you don't say nothing, kind of leaves my own red. Ain't that right, Jeremy? Sorry. <laughs> Yet, not my will, but your will. Luke would even go further and say he was so stressed out about this that he was sweating blood, which is a real thing that you can do if you get stressed enough. All I'm trying to do is show you that despair, sadness are a part of the journey with God. You will experience it. It's not always going to be Skittles, unicorns, and rainbows. In fact, I love how David put it in Psalms 23 when he said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because you are with me. The point of what I'm trying to say is we cannot make camp in the valley. We cannot make camp in the darkness. We cannot make camp in depression. We cannot make camp in despair. We have to keep on moving. We're called to walk with God step by step by step by step. And many of us have set up camps and villages and generations in darkness. Because you didn't want to walk because it was too tough. And God was like, if you just got to the other side, that's where the sun is. That's where the beach is. That's where your food is. That's where your wealth is. That's where your happiness is. That's where your joy is. But you made camp in your darkness. And God is saying, now I have to sit here with you until you're ready to move again. Look, he told, he told Elijah, get up and walk. It took him 40 days. He told him, get up. I have to feed you because you, you can't even make the journey. Elijah ran into darkness and he sent up a break station there. Coffee and donuts and was hanging out. Now, there are, I have to say this, there are situations where there is spiritual depression that Pastor Dustin can deal with. And then there's mental depression that you need professionals to help you deal with, Christian professionals that can give you a mix of both. Watch this. Both types of depression requires prayer, but the person to deal with them may change. And a lot of folks will say, we'll pray this depression away. And you may be, if it's spiritual based, I would say, yeah, you can. It can be healed. But if it's mental, go see somebody and talk to somebody. We can't, Pastor Dustin and myself and other elders and ministers at the church can't do it all. We don't have all the answers. I would like to think that we do. We don't. It's some people that have been trained and with the school that are filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the Spirit that can walk you through some grieving steps, that can walk you through some drug addiction steps, that can walk you through some stuff, but step by step. And you have to reach out and you have to grow. It is okay to go through those things. It's not okay to stay in those things. Real quick, can I be transparent? Can I be real transparent? Uh, I was going through a, a, a quarter life crisis. If you don't know what that means, I was 25. I was going through something. And I had a great job. I had just bought my first house. Uh, life was fair. If you looked at it, I was doing better than a lot of 25 year olds, to be honest. And I came to my mom's house at like, I want to say like 1 a.m. I know on a Friday night, going to your mom's house at 1 a.m., never nothing good, right? And I go to my mom and I say, Mama, I'm depressed. And my mom's like, okay, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. Now, the reason I was depressed was because I'm looking at all my friends get married, start families, and they just finding their romantic interests. And here I am at 25 thinking I was supposed to be married at 18, by the way, because that's how you, you know, growing up, you watch all the love movies, they got married young. And I'm not. I'm seven years off. And I'm like, what? Something is wrong with Trey. Because I was dating a lot, but it, wasn't, it was ended up bad all the time. And I know I became a laughing stock to my friends because he got another one. He got, he got another one. <laughs> you know it ain't going to work. I know it ain't going to work. <laughs> but he don't. <laughs> and it got to a point where it became overwhelming where I would get up as a youth pastor and preach to my kids and watch them experience life change. But I was running in the mud myself. And most of my sermons in this stage were encouragements to myself. They weren't even for the kids. God was just speaking to me. I need you to get up. I need you to get up. And I'm like, no, I'm laying back down and going to sleep. I'm like Elijah. And it got to a point where I was standing up for four to five days straight without sleeping, maybe two or three hours of sleep. Because I was so burdened by this. 
What's wrong with me, God? Where's my wife? Go to my mom. My mom looked at me, and she's like, boy, first of all, it's, it's, it's late. <laughs> but she's not with me, mom. She said, have you been sleeping? No, because she's not in the bed with me. My wife is not there. She said, sit down. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I felt like a three-year-old for real. And she said, sit here and meditate on the good things that God has done for you. And I sat there. And she put on a nice little spiritual meditation. She put on some worship music for me. And I went to sleep, like in a matter of minutes. When I woke up, she's like, how do you feel now? I feel better. And she says, you have to stop looking at what you don't have and start appreciating everything God has done for you now. That changed my life. Because it took my focus off me and put it back where it belongs on God. And what I'm trying to help somebody with sharing that little story with you, that it happens to the best of us. When we lose our focus and we point to something else and we look at something, why am I not rich? Why do I don't have a successful job? Why are my kids like, and we look and we just complaining. And God is like, but I did give you life. I did give you the kid. I did give you a job. I did. And God is sometimes saying, you're focused on the wrong things. Come back to me. Yeah. Hey, point number two, before I keep you too long, Pastor Devin took a lot of my time with that, that uh, announcement. So I think I, <laughs> I think I can reclaim some of my time back. <laughs> Point number two, there should be some dialogue. Verses 7 through 14 show a conversation between God and Elijah, and Elijah doing the bulk of the talking. What I've come to discover is that when we go through despair moments, we talk to a lot of people other than God. You call your girlfriend first, your homeboy, you call your friend, you call your husband, you call your mama, like I did. You call, you call everybody else. And God is like, I'm, I'm available. Trey, you didn't have to drive 30 minutes to your mom's house. You could have came and saw, you could have talked to me in your bedroom. But I need a mom. You could have talked to me. And, just, and I'm not saying don't talk to people. You do. But what I'm also saying is you should be having a dialogue, dialogue with God. Dialogue means it's a two-way street type conversation. It's not just one person talking. And a lot of times we say we're praying to God. Okay, we're talking to him, but we never wait for his answers. How many times when you prayed, have you sat there and said, I'm going to sit for 15 minutes because I just prayed for two minutes, so I'm going to sit for 15 for your answer. I'm going to open my word up and see, can I find the answer? I'm going to listen to some worship music and see, can I find the answer? Or better yet, I'm going to wait here in the stillness and the quietness for the gentle whisper. There has to be active conversations. You know what? Uh, one of the three things that hurt marriages and I would say hurt any relationship is what? You got sex, finances, and what? Communication. And it's really communication that throws off the first, the next two. If you're not talking, if you're married, you ain't, y'all ain't getting busy if you're not talking. And you ain't talking, and the money fine, y'all not talking about fixing it. So it can throw off the relationship. In the same way, we need communication with God to understand our purpose and plan, but the problem is we're not dialoguing, we're just talking at. Hey, God, do this for me, do this for me, do this for me, do this for me. Oh, yeah, don't forget, I love you. But do this for me, do this for me, do this for me, do this for me. And God is saying, like, I got an answer, but can can you stay for a minute? And we're like, no, I got to go. Sometimes God is trying to FaceTime you, and you keep hitting the ignore button. God is texting you, and you can leave him on red. I don't like that answer. And we have to get into a dialogue with God about our purpose, about our plan. Hey, uh, um, Pastor and Dustin and I, we talk e- almost every day, but we don't talk on the phone. We, eh, we do, but it's not like on the phone, all right? We use an app called Marco Polo, and we joke because that's where we're most intimate with ourselves. Like, like, hey, this is what's going on with me, and we share on this app because we can't talk all the time on the phone. He has three boys. I have a daughter. We have families. We have wives. We're doing things, and you just can't really sit on the phone and do everything. So on this app, it allows you to record FaceTime-like messages and send them to the people you want to of your choice and your contact. So he may respond, and we may have a conversation for days about one thing through the app. And it's good because we both kind of do the same thing, I noticed, is we find spaces in our lives where we can attentively listen to each other. It's, I never see Nicole in the background. For the most part, he never sees D in the background. He never sees, for the most part, Annalie in the background. And I never see his kids in the background. It's either in the vehicle Sometimes on the toilet, <laughs> if I'm being honest, mostly me, it's, it's in the office, but it's, no one is normally ever around. 
so that we can be intimate and talk from our hearts as brothers. And what I like about that is we can rewatch it and talk freely about everything. And, I'm, and I, as I did, as I was preparing this sermon, I was like, this is, the most, this is what we bond at the most. We bond, you now we see each other, we love each other, we play around, but, but it's our Marco Polos where we connect even greater than college because we're so intimate with each other. The crazy thing about it is, is the question I would have is, when do you have your Marco Polo time with God? Where are you going? Let me talk to this side. I'm just bump this side. I'm going to talk to this side. Do you have time where you and God say, hey, this is our time. I'm putting on the do not disturb. I'm focused on God. I'm loving on God. God, you can love back on me. Okay, okay, okay. Nope, 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 nope. I don't like that side. Nope, that side is not where I need to be. Okay, let's try this side. Y'all look a little bit more spiritual. Okay, here we go. You should be having time where you're saying, God, from 9 a.m., this is whatever time you got, from 9 a.m. 9 to 9.30, nobody can bother me in this time. My husband should know. My wife should know. My cat should know. My dog should know. The goldfish should know. My nanny should know. The room of vacuum cleaner should know. Between 9 a.m. and 9.30, nobody talks to me. No one says anything because I am sitting in the presence of my Savior, my God, my Lord, and I have to be intimate with him. 30 minutes, that's a long time. We do a lot. That's a TV episode with no commercials. You'll be okay. What if you sat in the presence of God and said, God, I anoint this time for you. Just us. Just you and I. Then God will begin to hear you differently, see you differently. I was talking to my wife about bonding, what it means to bond. In marriage, you really have to be, this key word, intentional about the time. It's ironic that Paul compares our relationship with God as a marriage. And what Paul was trying to get us to see is that if you're not intentional about spending time with God, then your relationship with him will begin to wane and fail, which can lead you to despair. And it bothers me because sometimes we get caught up in being busy. I talk to my mentees, oh, I just like I haven't made time. But if God took your time, would you be mad? What do you mean, Trey? If God says, I'm going to put you in the hospital on your back so you can look at me. Then you're like, can y'all come pray for me? I always tell people, when I go and visit the hospital, if God wants you to be here now, I'm not interrupting anything God is trying to do. I might not be the person to call. I'm like, are you okay? You're alive? All right. Have you been talking to God? No. I think you should. It's perfect time. You have what? Time. And I'd rather give my time than God take my time. Hey, hey, many of us, we got to start looking for, stop looking for the big moments in God and start looking for the still quiet moments. It didn't happen in the in earthquake. It didn't happen in the wind. It didn't happen in the fire. It happened at the edge of the cave in a gentle whisper with one question. What are you doing here? God didn't even make, it wasn't even complicated. God was like, hey, the question was, what are you doing? That's the easy question to ask. Last point, and I get y'all out of here. It's direction. Look at your neighbor and say direction. So in dark moments, you'll experience despair. In dark moments, you need to have some dialogue. But in dark moments, you need some direction. How do you get out of here? And I love what the Lord says to him after Elijah says, I'm the only one. They're killing everybody else. Ain't nobody here but me. And, you, and now they're trying to kill me too. And God, you ain't even doing nothing. And God just says this back. This is God's response back to him when he says that. He said, hey, man, go back from where you came from and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hezel, king over Aram. He doesn't even respond. You know what that teaches me? God does not accept excuses. But God does accept your obedience. You know what that teaches me? God doesn't partake in pity parties. But God does accept your faith. And, and, and I can't, I can't, I can't get stuck in despair like situations because I can't follow simple instructions. Instructions. See, see, some of us are hard-headed. And if you grow up with a grandma like I grew up, a hard head makes a what? 
A lot of people got whoopers in this room, too. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. A lot of connections today. John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, you will obey my, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. And I'm not even talking about the big commands. I'm talking about the simple ones. I like, like the ones like don't lie. Like the ones like love your neighbor. Like the ones like don't put into the God before me. Like don't covet. Don't be jealous. Like don't put, make, make no idols before me. And some of us got an idol right now on our lap, in our phones, in our hand right now. You can leave that thing at the house, get to church, and turn around and go and get it. <laughs> what I'm talking about? What I'm talking about? That cell phone. Y'all know. Y'all don't even want to call your God name. Phone. You go leave, you leave the house. I just feel naked because you don't have a phone. And God is often looking at us like, hey, you're better than this. I have a stronger purpose than this. And we, we often live our lives like this. Hey, God, I'd rather just ask for forgiveness than, per, than permission. And I don't want to live my life with God like that. Why are we asking God for permission to do certain things? You know why? Because we know the answer. You, you, can, can I, can I, how real can I be? Can I, can I be real for a second? Yeah, okay, we've got to go. We, I can be real. Yeah, y'all, y'all can email Pastor Desmond. All right, here we go. You know why we don't ask God for permission? Because you know you're not supposed to be sneaking at their house at 2 a.m. You know you're supposed to be stealing the office supplies. You know you're not supposed to be talking to that person like that when you marry. You know you're supposed to give more of your time, your talents, and treasures to the church, but you just don't. You don't ask for God's direction because sometimes you know the answer. And I don't know where you at in your life, but I guarantee your life would get a little bit better. You start asking God, do you want me to do this? I'll wait. I'll wait until you tell me. If you don't tell me to do it, God, I'm, then I'm, I'm, I'm at, because I can't hear you. Let me ask some questions. I'm going to ask some spiritual people in my life. Hey, I'm asking God for these things. Can y'all reach out to God? Because I, I don't hear it. I don't want to make a mistake. Some of us don't even want to do that. Because you know the answer. But when God gives you direction, you got to listen. You can't, you got to stop making excuses for why you can't and start giving up reasons why you can. Hey, my godson, Chris, is in the back to the right, to my right, your left. He's in the back, glasses on, blue shirt. Um, I'm teaching him some stuff that men are supposed to do at night when it comes down to the house. If you're a man, you understand what I'm about to say. If you're not doing this, then I'm about to educate you that you probably should be doing this, okay? Is before you go to sleep, you're supposed to check all the, this is my dad taught me, check all the doors. Make sure they're locked. (laughs) You might have forgotten to lose. It just happens. We're humans. Check the windows, some lower level windows to make sure they're locked. I didn't teach him, hey, hey, Christian, turn off the stove. Make sure that you got gas stove like I do. Turn it off. Make sure. Ain't no gas coming out. You don't blow up in your sleep. Make sure everything. You don't want to go to bed and hear the alarm go, doo the door open, and you don't know where or why it opened. And you like me, I'm like, hey, D, we going down there together? Because we, <laughs> we, 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 we said, we, I vow say to the end. <laughs> and the, the, the vows don't say nothing about me by myself now. Come on. <laughs> And, 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 and last night, we come home from this wedding. When our friends got married, we come home from the wedding. And, you know, I'm getting out. And I'm like, man, I got to finish touching up the sermon. D, can you hook my hair up? Because it's looking crazy. And I, so I'm rushing. And then she gets to the front door. And she does. And when she does it, she looks back at me. And she's like, did you see that? And at first, I was like, no, what happened? Because I'm like, oh, now I'm really scared. Like, somebody in the house? Like, like, <laughs> like you better get hit first. Like, back up. <laughs> and she said, no, the door. She said, no, the door was open. I said, oh. Okay, cool. So then I go downstairs and I let my dogs out. And I'm like, oh, man, the basement door was open. So now I'm, now I'm like, someone's in the house. And everyone's upstairs. They could be getting mass murdered. My mind is going like, goes crazy. Do I, now my brain goes, do you run? Do you stay? Do you call the police? What do you do here, Trey? Do you play hero? Like, so my brain goes crazy. So I go upstairs. I just get some confidence. I'm with my bare fist. I don't have a, no, no weapons or nothing like that in my house. I just got these. God bless me. And, and I go to the room, and Christian is sleep knocked out. And the level of disappointment in my face, I'm like, so you're asleep in the bed as if nothing, nothing could have happened. And I don't walk around the house and killed all y'all in my mind. 
And I said to him, hey, boom, you're dead. Boom. I, I, he's asleep. I turned the light and said, boom, you're dead. This is because that's all I got. You're dead. And he's like, what? I gave him simple instructions. When I am not here at the house, you're next up in line, which means you have to make sure this house is secure. You have to make sure the people in the house are good, and you have to make sure at least we can make it through the night. What I'm trying to get you to see is that sometimes God gives us simple instructions, but we're so tired and we're so weary and we can't push through that you're leaving yourself even more vulnerable than you ever thought. You know, you don't... You, you, don't, you, you don't think that your despair and your depression can last longer without God? It can. You don't think that coming here on Sundays and being around, I get a lot of my energy from just being around other believers. And I see y'all smiling. I know y'all going through some stuff, but to see you smile, it makes me smile. It warms my heart because that means we can get through this thing. This means that God is still working in my neighbors and my brothers and my sisters in Christ. But all we have to do is sit back and get some direction from him. Many of us fail because we can't handle the direction from God. Direction from God. See, we want God to, 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 to take us out of despair, kind of. We, we, want, we, want, we treat God like social media, which is we want God to like the post when we say we sad. We want God to give a comment. We want God to comment with heart eyes and purple emojis. We don't want God to change the post. And God is looking at some of y'all and say, y'all been here too long, so now I have to ask the question, what are you doing here? Stand up with me.